All I want is to keep my head down and get square. If you catch a fever, I'll chop my nuts off and watch a grate them over salad and these ones, right? A lot of people suck their necks out of you, Barry. Looks like you and me, we don't get square. I, I thought we'd probably just start off with a, a chat before we go to the questions. I mean, I, I'm sure there's lots of things people want to know about. Um, but I guess of most interest to me, when I've seen the film a couple of times now, is uh, you know the nature of comedy, um, both at the screenplay stage, in performance, uh, you know, right down to I guess where you put the camera. You know, how do you make things funny, and yet still have some kind of empathetic quality? Um, you know, specifically I guess David Wenham's performance, um, which has touches of Buster Keaton. Um, and yet, strangely, despite the kind of heightened nature of the performance style, uh, he's a character you really care about. These are all um, very specific choices, no doubt, that were made by all of you. Mm. So, I mean, going back to the start, I guess, let's, let's have a look at the script. I mean, was it funny on the page? When I, um, when I first read the script, it was like a hundred and... I think it was a 156-page monologue, and uh, it had... Uh, it was you know, like a doorstop, like a phone book kind of thing. And Chris had written it in a way. It was written by Chris Nice, who um, is a criminal justice lawyer up in Queensland and uh, practices on the Gold Coast. And um, all the action and all the dialogue and everything was just mixed in, in all amongst it uh, throughout the writing. And uh, you came across scenes where it would go on for 10, 15, some, I think the longest scene was 18 pages of dialogue. And... Um, and I just pissed myself out loud, just laugh after laugh after laugh. But it wasn't, it was the sort of thing that you when, you, when you enjoy that sort of guttural, fundamental experience of laughing at something, it's a combination of identification, it's a combination of um, getting, sharing time with a character or with a bunch of characters that really um, somehow strike a chord with you, even though it, their lives aren't your experience. In a way, they're opening up a window to their life. Um, and immediately, I mean, I, th I can remember very, very clearly on reading it the first time, um, not only laughing out loud, so the comedy was on the page, but there was something about it that was so different to um, amusing things that, that, that I'd read before, or funny things that I'd read before, and in many ways different to the script that I wrote, which was the basis of my first film, Better Than Sex. And it was what I what I realised very quickly was that it was incredibly character based, and immediately I felt, even just on a first reading, that it was something that the potential to make a, a film out of it was so great um, that it, that, it, that it attracted me to it straight away. But it was. It was also that it was a really exciting moment because you, I, found, I feel, felt as if I'd found some material where I could set out to make a film um, that wasn't um, sort of based on trying to self-consciously make an audience laugh. It was about making a, making a film about a, a, a bunch of characters and in a sense it is a character piece for, first and foremost. Um, and that the, the material, even at that shambolic stage of the script, um, the material was so strong and the dialogue was so strong that, um, that just to go down that road of uh, making, in a, in a way, treating it very seriously and treating it as if it wasn't a comedy, um, we, could, we could make something that was you know, very amusing and very you know, enjoyable <coughs> at the same time, but, but because it gave us access to these characters. What, what, what did it take to make it better? So you, you got the script. I mean, I assume Martin, you were on board prior to this, or? We, uh, well, <coughs> it's a little bit complicated the timeline, but uh, in, in a nutshell, uh, I, I remember getting a copy of it, and I thought very much like Jonathan that it was all over the place, um, but that it had the kernel, it had the core of a really great film. What what needed to happen to to well, make it funnier? <coughs> Sorry? What, what needed to happen to it? The, well, it needed to be, I mean, first of all, I thought, you know, we needed to, uh, to uh, for, for Jonathan to put his visual style on the film, on the, on the script, and, uh, and to work with Chris very closely, and the two of them worked mm. for, oh... Six, months. eight months, yeah. Yeah, at least eight months working yeah. together. I mean, it, it needed to be turned into a film is basically That's the answer, right. isn't it? I mean, and, and in answer to the question, what, 
what needed doing to it to make it better. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the things we were very conscious of was that it's very easy to go, okay, it's 158 pages. <coughs> we want to try and get it down to around 105 or so. Um, so, you know, you're talking about losing, losing a good third of the script. And it, the one thing this, this, this had, it was very clear, was it, it had a spirit that you didn't want to lose. And it was protecting that spirit whilst trying to pare down these pages of dialogue that, you know, a lot of the time were incredible pieces of writing. Um, the scene um, where uh, Chicka comes into the restaurant and him and Barrington go at each other, um, sitting down at, the, at one of the booths, that, was, that, that scene now is about half as long as it was. Um, and we cut out a lot of things. And I think one of the things that made it better was actually paring back certain, certain elements um, that heightened you know, the, the comedy, the natural mm. comedy that was there. Um, Do you imagine um, specific actors when, you, when you're working at that stage in, um, in roles? Well, I certainly, as soon as, after one reading, I said, David's got to do this. You know, it, 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 would, it, was, it presented an opportunity for him to do something totally different than what he'd done before. Um, I, funnily enough, it was not long before we'd had a discussion, David and I, about um, just the, 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 the idea of a character actor versus a leading man. It was a very sort of, you know, sort of off the cuff kind of conversation. It just, it struck me that he was a character that David could play so brilliantly. And, and I was very, very concerned that in not only David's role, but, but in, but in um, all the roles that um, we got really, really good actors um, who would make the characters multi-dimensional, even though they, would, they didn't have necessarily a lot of screen time, that we went down that road of making it almost as if we weren't even considering that we were making a comedy. Um, and that, they, that, the act, that I wanted to work with actors who were going to flesh out and mm. develop the characters so that, so that it would be... Because I felt at its heart it's a character piece. And um, I didn't want it to be sort of a mock genre piece. I didn't want it to be, you know, I wanted the, first and foremost to be about the characters and then all the other elements help, help mm. us get through the story. Because there is, you know, it's interesting, David, what, what did you think of the script when you got it? Because, you know, there's, there's always a space between the script and the, and the film for an actor, isn't there, <coughs> where, where you invent and contribute and, you know, embellish and add things to, to a character. What, what was on the page for you when you, when you read and it? He's one of the great embellishers. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I had a job. No, most important thing. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I, just, I think we're, we're, I think we're sort of they were thinking about Chica first, and then you I, looked at it originally for Chica. Yeah, yeah, and then I just preferred De Vere's yeah. because you know, it was which is sort I, of ironic. The same reason as something I hadn't done. So mm. yeah. you know, it's, it's you know you're always choosing something you haven't done. Hopefully, mm. you know? I think also mm. that I mean yeah. one of the one I like of the reality of it. So sorry, Johnny, yeah. but I like the reality of it. I felt that. And to find out Chris, you know, who Chris was later, you know, I, I, I just thought that this guy knew the Gold Coast, that, that, you know, so often we try to shoot the Gold Coast and all of a sudden it was, it's like, it's that's parody. about, it's that's about parody, right, yeah. you know? So there was, there was a, a level of truth in, 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 the, in the, the style of what he, you know, the characters he was writing about, mm. you know, white because watches he knew that on world, the Gold yeah. Coast with your white shoes and your gold chains, you know? We've all seen it, but he kind of, he nailed a bit, you know, mm. deeper because he, he knows those people. Mm. You know, and you could smell that in the script. I think. Do people know the the writer? I mean, he's um, notorious kind of um, <coughs> character who represents uh, many people, including most recently Pauline Hanson, in her uh, yeah. battle to stay out. Battle of to stay out. Of prison, yeah. <laughs> but that's Jack interesting as a writer. Up there. The thing about Chris is that he he actually grew up on the Gold Coast. Mm. I mean, Chris is absolutely a classic Gold Coast boy. You know, yeah. and he he, sure he loves the place, and he you know. Um, you know, he just, he, he br drink, breathed the Gold Coast, really, and, and it kind of follows him around, and, and uh, he, um, he, it's a classic example, and I've said this on a couple of occasions, and he sort of takes mock offence at it, but it's a, a great, a great um, example of someone who's written something that they know, um, and I think that's probably the first most important thing about the piece of writing that he did, yeah. was that, as, as David said, you know, it just ha it, it, the script really felt like he was someone who was letting you into a world that they knew very intimately. Yeah. Um, and a as Chris has told me, you know, even, even the Spateri courtroom scene, all, all those, there's no, there's, every scene in the film has some element of truthfulness to it in his, in his experience as a lawyer. 
Um, none of those characters are based literally on anybody, but um, they're an amalgam of experiences, things he's heard, things he's seen at different times, practicing you know, for 20 years. Um, we actually met the, uh, the, 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 the character that Barrington was very loosely based on. And <laughs> I think at one point he was going to play a, play a, play cameo a background role, uh, a yeah, background role but uh, we felt that... The ha but I, I can remember Chris telling me that he actually read part of the, uh, of the, uh, the script and felt that perhaps it was a bit too close to him and he didn't want to play it. Mm. With, with a specific scene, I think you know, the courtroom scene is mm. just an absolute... A magnificent piece of comic performance yeah. and writing, and <coughs> but there's a moment in it where he falls off the chair, mm. and it's a physical comedic moment mm. that we don't see that often in Australian comedy. It's like a a technical craft that mm. Keaton and Chaplin and even mm. the Jim Carreys of the world have, and 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 subsequently there's the scene where he's he's on, he's on the chair in the yeah. in the the, the yeah. cell room waiting for, which is also what? That, that physical comedy interests yeah. me as a... Well, what, what, what was really... I mean, what's interesting about all the physical comedy... Well, in a way, <coughs> memorable physical comedy moments in the, in the script, uh, or in the film, is that none of them existed in the script. Um, the, the, the chair thing... Um, let me just firstly say, the, the courtroom scene was one of those just fantastic kind of days you have as a filmmaker where every element comes together. You know, David by then had established this character that was just you know, could go anywhere. The writing was sensational and it, from that very first draft of the script that I read, not one word ever changed in that courtroom scene. Um, and every element came together, you know, the production design, the, the setting, even Jonathan Biggin's performance as David's foil in that is, is, is fantastic. And it was one of those great moments where they all come together to create that, to create that scene. Um, and I remember us sort of just choreographing the elements of that scene before, you know, just going through it with David and Jonathan at the beginning of the day. And um, I think David said to you both, you know, says, mentioned to you that the chair that the production design team had put um, for him to sit on, David said, came up to us and said, you know, it's not a funny chair. And, um, and so we got this other chair that was much more unstable and much more um, in keeping with um, what, what, he, what he felt was what his character needed to sit on. And out of that came, and I, I just sort of was, we were talking to Gary Phillips, who was the DOP, and we were setting some things up and sort of just, just going through the basic setups we were going to use. And um, as David does, I saw him just sort of mucking around and looking at the chair and look, turning it upside down and adjusting it. And, you know, that should be, a, in itself, that, was a little, that should be a little Spatiri scene in its own right because it was a, a classic sort of Chaplin-esque comedic thing of him trying to adjust it and this, that, and the other. And then, I then just turned around, I couldn't believe it, he turned around, sat on it and fell off it. And immediately that became part of the film, you know. And, and, but one of the things I was very, you know, we, both of us were very conscious about is I didn't want to overplay the Spatiri hand, um, which would maybe ever tip him into um, sort of caricature. Um, and whilst I felt confident with that, um, there are other elements that we took out or didn't use because they were overblown. And with, with that, I think you have to be really careful. And um, I mean, as, a <clears throat> as an interesting thing, if you just look at that as, a, as an individual thing, it's just a guy falling off a chair. What makes it funny and what, what, what allowed it to be funny, I think, is, is the basic character that, that had now been established in the film. Mm. And mm. in a sense, in a very serious way. And the seriousness with which he is taking or appears to be taking everything that's being thrown at him in that courtroom, um, he's totally unselfconscious that he's making a group of people laugh at him um, or with him. And actually, Chris told me that he'd seen a scene very similar to that. And to this day, this is like 10 years ago, he still hasn't worked out whether the guy was the smartest or the dumbest guy he's ever mm. laid eyes on. And that's the tone with which David played that, which allows, I think, something as broad and as slapstick as that falling off the chair to work so well. Mm. Um, I mean, just going to, you know, the, the, the two other ones that I sort of think of immediately is David running down the street with his jocks on, um, which is, you know, is continually one of those things that's, you know, it's a very kind of broad um, physical piece of comedy. Um, what made that scene, what made that really work was, number one, we were never going to shoot that scene in that location. And it was only at the last minute that the location we had fell through 
and we ended up shooting in that place, which actually had a, an alleyway for him to run down. We were never going to shoot him running down an alleyway. And the other thing was, the day before, he strained a muscle in his leg um, that made him run like he, you see him running Are you now. Kidding? Um, and the combination of all those things. But what, I guess the point that, that, that's really important about it, I think, is that they're all character traits. They're all character, things that, that build his character first and foremost, as opposed to um, an attempt by the actor or attempt by, a, an attempt by um, the character to be funny. And I think that's what sustains those mm. broad comic things. And, and the third one, which is him when he's fiddling about in the, wait, in the CIC waiting room, again, was... He was, he was doing that stupid thing on the chair, backing it up and backing it up and falling. And he didn't actually even fall off in, in the first when he was doing it. And we both looked at each other and said, we've, got to, we've just got to film 10 minutes of this. And we just literally did half a dozen things, him lying on the chair, falling over, doing this, standing in the corner. All those little, some of the things you see on the screen and a few others. And in the actual take, he did the backing it up and then falling over on the wall. And hurt himself. And, and, no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so... Um, it's sort of ironic that none of those were actually in the script, but came out of a foundation that the script, the script provided, which was to provide a very strong character mm. out of which those things can work. Just probably just before one, one last question before yeah. we move on. Um, with the edit, mm. in terms of comedy again, in terms of the timing and the pacing, and in terms of how you get a sense of, I mean, you can sit with an audience now and you realise that the pacing and the timing mm. of certain scenes works very well. Yeah. You know, but when you're isolated and working mm. in the edit, how, how does your process, you know, expose the comic elements within it mm. to, to scrutiny yeah. when they ultimately are going to be dependent on a... Well, on you know, I mean, the first, the first part of that is that you rely very heavily on your editor, you know, and um, I was lucky to have Ken Sallows cutting the film, who has great experience with comedy. And actually I had a very productive conversation with Ken before we shot, just about the... the, the um, how to, you know, how his experience of covering comedy with a camera, you know, and the, 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 you don't actually, he's actually found you don't actually need close-ups, it's more in the, in, in wide shots and mid shots and what have you, which is kind of totally tantamount to the style in which I was approaching the film to, to begin with. When I adjusted it and actually, you know, Ken said to me as the first thing he's cut, whereby he's used so many more close-ups and still made the comedy to work. But just in terms, I think it's just a very difficult thing and it's just about time really. And then you... Did get, you test it? Did you test we it? We tested it just around the time we locked the picture off, wasn't it? And got, you know, a fantastic response. And it was a very, you know, it was a very raw, it was the first answer print, so every edit was a, was a jump. Was, yeah. But it's still, it's still, the, 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 what we were more interested in, what I was more interested in is not trying to, instead of trying to go down the road, is the of analysing the comedy of it, but making the characters work and making the, in a sense, the shaggy dog nature of the narrative flow from one scene to the other. And I mm. felt really confident that, that was the other thing, once they got work, once they were working, the other things would, f the funny things would fall into place. Some, some questions? Any of these guys? This one here, there's a microphone coming around too, so. We, we, we were fortunate enough, enough to see that uh, test screening at uh, Fox Studios, I think in about February. All right, um, and enjoyed it immensely, uh, and 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 I felt in being invited along, I might have a part in actually framing the finished product. But when I got there, I felt that it was more about kind of the marketing aspects of it that you were interested in. I'd just be interested to hear what you were really after there. Were, were you, you know, did the film change much after that test screening, or were you just looking for how you might market it? Um, well, I mean, the nature the nature of that that kind of thing is set up to test it for you know, kind of response and what have you. There's an element of marketing, I guess, about it. It's a two-fold thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but, you know, f fundamentally, as a filmmaker, you know, at that stage, you don't give a monkeys about the marketing. I mean, from my own personal point of view, in a sense, it's an, you know, it was one of the very first, if not the first, um, public screening. Um, what you want to do is see an audience, you know, I think there was a couple of hundred people there that night. You want to see an audience respond to the film. Um, and that is ultimately what, it, what it's about. You know. Is there a question here? Yeah. Yep. Uh, firstly, congratulations on the film. I thought it was fantastic. Thank you. Um, all the characters and the work and the, it was really brilliant. Uh, I just wanted to know, what was the timeline between uh, you having a look at the script, mm -hmm. 
putting it into production and then obviously finishing off? I mean, I think it was quite quick. I mean, Actually, I, I, just having worked on a number of uh, feature films, I could say this film got into production quicker than any other. Um, we got funded in July of last year and it's uh, about 14 months later that we're, we're releasing it. Um, and while there was an awful lot of work done prior to that, um, it got together very quickly. Um, and, just, and it was interesting because David was the first uh, character, f first actor on, yep. and then I think Tim was the next actor that we yep. got on. And at that point, everybody else just fell into place, and, and uh, including the wonderful time in Melbourne with Gary Sweet where uh, we went down to meet with him and he turned up in in the outfit that he thought the chicka would be wearing in the movie, which is fairly <laughs> incredible. In Melbourne. It was, it was totally wrong. <laughs> yeah. It was midwinter in Melbourne. Yeah, yeah right. But but it was a very quick. Yeah, it was quick. It was probably, you know, um, as, as Martin said before, Chris and I developed, we met, we developed the script with Mushroom and Martin for about eight months. Working Title came on board for, and it was probably a couple of months. Yeah. And then took us up to um, the 30th of June, where we were part of the Macquarie F Nine Fund. And, and, and we were lucky enough to be the f one of the two films chosen for that, so we were instantly funded. And really then we were in, you know, sort of pre-production. We shot from October through to December and then of last year, and then we're up to here now. So, you know, whatever that is, it's probably, you know, in the end, about two years. Uh, another question quickly is, how much freedom do you allow the actors when you're working with them, and David as well? Absolutely none. <laughs> <laughs> no, look... Um, I mean, I, I'm glad you sort of mentioned that because I'd like to bring David in on this because there's, um, I, what, I, what, I, what I try very hard to do is to provide an environment. I mean, hopefully you're working with good material, which we all felt we were. Um, but I try to provide an, an environment whereby the talent and the personality of each of the actors can con contribute as, hopefully as much as possible. I mean, I hope that it will be our relationship is very much a greater than the sum of the parts. Um, that's how I kind of see the relationship. And a, and a very good example of that was, um, and I've been asked about it a few times, was in the Into My Arms se sequence um, where um, we see Arnie DeVere sitting in his car singing the song, or a line of the song, um, of, as to how that came about and what have you. And, and it came about very much from a discussion that David and I had, and, and a lot of what David brought to that sequence in particular and to his character in, in general. Um, and one of the things, and, and a couple of people have asked me, you know, it's one of those sort of, in inverted commas, weird things that happen in films that some people relate to and some people like and some people don't and all those kind of things. But the, the underlying thing is that what I love about it and was the abiding thing as to why it should be in the film is that it's actually a moment of empathy with that very unsympathetic character. Um, and so you, so you feel, well I hope you feel, and I certainly do, there's a moment where we see the sadness and that here's a cop from another era whose time has gone. Um, and that's why I like it a lot. And it, you know, it wouldn't have been in there if it wasn't for what David brought to the, brought to the, the development of his character and to um, elements that, that, that he suggested and, and that we tried out. Just collaborative, yeah. yeah. Yes, collaborative. Look, I. In fact, I remember that was that was at the rehearsal up. It up was, north. yeah. And I just, I just didn't like. I thought the scene was as it was written. I thought it was cliche, so I wanted to do something different to him rather than be seen bashing him and then mm. have him go and make love to his girl. Somehow it didn't feel right. And Johnny said, "Well, what do you do?" I said, "Sing to him with the window up." And he said, what? And I said, Peter Frampton's, I want you to show me the way. Because <laughs> I just heard it in the makeup bus. But, you know, and then they, you know, went on to that. But, you know, it's, it's, it's collaborative. I mean, I think the also, whole idea with actors coming to films is you bring a thousand percent and if they use three, well, that's their business, you know, because they're the boss, you know, ultimately. But, but the, I think you've got to have, yeah. you know, some sense. It's of also, I mean, the two, the two things I'd say about that. Number one, it's exciting, you know, when, you, when you're kind of exploring things together and... I like that relationship with the actors, um, whereby, you know, so much that's in the film, the film is absolutely peppered with little moments. Um, for example, Rick Carter's moment where, he, where Barrington comes back to the restaurant and he says, there's a lot of fucking people. 
Um, <laughs> you really get a sense of, I mean, that was a, a spontaneous thing that Rick brought to, to that moment. And what's great about it is you really get a sense of here's this guy who's been this Barrington sidekick for so long and he's not at all happy about being working a normal job in a restaurant. And, uh, you know, it'd be a great job if it wasn't for the paying customers. Um, <clears throat> and so, I mean, you know, that, that, that there should be, I mean, in my, my opinion, there should be that space. But hopefully as a director you give them good material and you give them an environment in which that, you know, is, you, you, you open, you're very open to those suggestions. There's a question just here. Uh, is this on? Yeah, I've got a question. Just when you were working on the script, a lot of the um, a lot of the events that inform the action with the forward momentum are very much in the past, and they seem to come through in a very expositional way. And I was wondering whether or not you thought about playing with the timeline and bringing some of those actions actually, like physically, onto the screen. Mm. And another question is. Did you have to make really radical choices about which characters you were actually going to pursue from the original um, script? Because there was some really lovely... Um, I think one of the, one of the criminals which um, was being interviewed for parole at the start was mm. then came back at the end and there was this sort of big gap in his journey in the middle yeah. where we didn't really get any kind of empathetic sense of who he was, but he was very vivid when we saw him, and I was wondering whether that was sort of a, a choice that you had to make. Ab absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, when the, when the, in, in its first draft, the script was full of, there was probably about another 10 characters. Yeah. And, um, I mean, for example, there was a, there was a guy who, in, another guy in the parole scenes um, called Royce, who went on for three pages about ostrich farming, which is what he was going to do um, once he got out of prison. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this incredible dialogue about all the things you could do with ostrich meat um, unfortunately got lost. And, and we also amalgamated some of the things that, that went on into the others. And, and um, for example, believe it or not, the, the scene where David Wenham's character, Spatiri, holds up the service station was actually, I think, probably the character you're talking about. Um, was, it was him, it was, that was his scene. But we actually, we actually needed to bring, it was much more a sense of a whole lot of characters. We needed to focus in a little bit more on the Barrington, the, the Barry and the Spateri characters. And so we kind of did quite a lot of work on, um, on bringing, bringing more of a focus into their, into that sort of central storyline. Um, I think also that, that, you know, you're right, you know, we meet these guys at the, um, at the head of, at, in those parole things, and never really sort of see them. They're part of the robbery, but they're never really part of the, f the fabric of the film. And we actually cut a couple of scenes that they were in, um, which, you know, developed their characters a little bit more, but they never really went anywhere. Um, and so they were, um, I mean, in the same way, you know, we, we meet three quite interesting, or certainly two quite interesting characters in the, in the courtroom scenes before the Spateri courtroom scene, and we don't really know much about them, but you know, the, I, guess, I guess you make decisions that the quality of, the, of those little portraits are strong enough to punctuate the film and you know, are, are you know, kind of enjoyable to, to come across in the cinema. And you see some of the key moments yeah. that didn't occur on screen that were poorly reported in the sort of actors. We considered it, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, you end up sort of almost then shooting two films um, because you've got, you, you know, you've, you're shooting the people talking it and you're shooting that. And what we, what we sort of, um, what I, I guess I, I liked about the spirit of the film was an opportunity to, that the char I felt that the characters were strong enough to sustain the conversations that they had. Um, I mean, there wasn't really the opportunity to go and film all those other things. Certainly, we, we, we talked about it a great deal as to what we did, and in fact we did bring some of those elements into it and tried to, and we, you know, we just tried to visualise and give the film a style, a visual style that would sustain, um, I mean some of, one of the most obvious ones is, um, you pro probably noticed that in the framing of particularly close-ups of dialogue, often put people on side of frames and what have you with their eye line going directly out of frame. And, and part of that was to make, still allow the, the, the visual interest to be there and, the, and to give the film a sort of visual fabric, if you like, whilst 
you know, they're going through, you know. The, the other thing I would say too is that it's very in keeping with those characters to sit around and bullshit the back, of, back leg off a chair for hours and hours. And Chris was very um, keen to keep that, to, to, to be true to that. And, you know, and one of the other things, I, you know, I think I probably said it to David, I said, certainly said it to everyone as, as, as much, you know, I think we had 80% of it we needed to respect that material. Mm. Um, and I think that was important too. Mm. It's a question here. On that. Yeah. Um, just following on from the, the visual fabric yeah. uh, that you were just talking about before, um, I noticed um, there were a couple of uh, shots where the, the physical landscape really dwarfed the, the individual actor, and I was just mm. interested in what you were trying to tell us in, in doing that. Well, I think um, the, the, thing about the act, uh, thing, about, thing about the characters is that um, when you go up to the Gold Coast, and trying to film there is, is actually quite... You know, you, you, you're forced into a, a place where you, you're trying to find a way of visually depicting the place. And I always, I always felt that it, it's, it's full of characters that are one step removed from reality, but they're but still believable. Um, and I like that stylized, or slightly stylized form. And so with, with going to the Gold Coast, you know, where you, you look at street level, it's a very, you know, the, 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 the street furniture is horrible, the, the lots, so much concrete, you know, and, and harshness that one of the things we tried to do is we used a very short depth of field to try and build um, a sense of mystery to the place. Um, I always liked the idea that, that you know, the Gold Coast would be a slightly iconic or mythical place rather than a naturalistic one, um, as depicted in something like um, a film you, some of you may know called Goodbye, Par Goodbye to Paradise, which was about it's 20 or 30 years ago now, but it, with Ray Barrett as a private detective on the, on, the, on the Gold Coast, which is a very naturalistic vision. Um, and so, and the other thing was to keep the camera quite low so that we could look up and see things like palm trees and those, that sort of cut out building against, you know, blue skies and what have you. Um, the thing is that, so that these characters, they don't exist on the Gold Coast per se, they exist in the shadows that the Gold Coast cast. And what I was, I guess, with those sort of more graphic wide landscapes, you have so little opportunity to get that sort of width on a landscape in the Gold Coast. Um, it was a great opportunity to just show how dwarfed these characters are by the, in a sense, our, our general understanding of what the Gold Coast is, which is a glitzy sort of, you know, you know, Vegas at the beach kind of sort of idea. So that was so sort of the general idea. Question just here. Um, <coughs> I noticed that the, the character of the film was very strong and, and all that stuff you're talking about did come through in the film very strongly. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you had a particularly long rehearsal period or if you did a lot of improvising while you were shooting the film right. and if also you um, had a great talk with the crew um, about the, the feel and the style or how you went about all that anyway. Certainly. Um, um we, uh, to answer the first question, we didn't have a long rehearsal period. Uh, it was, logistically, it was very difficult with a cast that size to get everyone together um, up on the Gold Coast, um, particularly as they may not be filming. Um, I mean, I think when you came up, you went back down again after rehearsal, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it was time, yeah. you know, logistically, it's very expensive and you use a lot of resources bringing people up and down, so... In fact, I think, really, the only time that everybody was there... Was, was the, the read-through. The read-through, which yeah. was really the day before we started shooting. Yeah. So, the rehearsal period was probably confined down to about a, about a week, um, and that was with the whole cast. So, you know, often, I did quite a bit of rehearsal you know, on weekends with um, David, uh, with Sam and Freya, um, and so it was, but it was generally a, a very short rehearsal period. In fact, I think that uh, with Timothy Spall, yeah, um, you did most of it on the telephone. Yeah, um, and he That's was shooting. True. He was shooting a Tom Cruise film at the uh, at the same time and coming back and forth, and we really had no time. I think we had three weeks with him. He came in for a week and went out, and then came back in for two weeks. So. I actually hold quite a lot of um, a lot of a lot in store by. Just building, being it, just sitting down, having you know a, a, a chat that has nothing to do with the literal performance of what we're trying to do, but just talking about character and talking about the general and in a sense bonding with the actor, um, so that our communication is very clear. You know, and I think once you get over that 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 hump of just having a very easy and clear communication with each other, then a lot of things fall into place. 
Um, so uh, it was, you know, when, when you often hear, oh, it, it's, it's, um, you had hardly any rehearsal. Actually, if you've, if you've kind of, kind of got on, you get on with the actor, and you, you have had a chance to just speak on. It doesn't really matter what it's about. It's just an opportunity to um, develop a, a line of communication mm. that's productive. I think that's, in many ways, it's as important as, as the as the actual literal. Uh, um, Rehearsal. Just one a question in the middle. Yeah. So I didn't get to some of the other ones, but yeah. yeah. David, I'm just wondering, how? Sorry, where did you begin to approach um, the characterisation of De Vere's, and how did it differ in your approach to the character of Bob Hawke? <laughs> <laughs> Different hairstyle. <laughs> um, I, pr I actually did approach this completely differently to, to anything I'd done before, because. Because when I, when I talked to her about with John, I kept saying, I, you know, it's, it, it's to me so much just a bad cop. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't work out who that was to bring to that. And plus, I think I, I felt a certain amount of lack of repertoire left for how many bad guys are in my left foot, you know what I mean? So talk, we talk said... about the sexual harassment thing, because I think that was a really, really interesting thing. What, what sexual harassment thing? The, the, you talked about... De Vere's, remember that discussion we had about De Vere's? About what he'd do late at night. Yeah, and also about how he's... <laughs> <laughs> and about... He didn't really. About, yeah. about, about how the attitude towards even Sa oh, you know, with not Sam... Sam. With Sam. Yeah, um, we, yeah, we, we, yeah, we did talk about the... Yeah, of him being very... Like, almost like a sexual predator. Yeah. Um, in terms of those two. And, you know, really wanting to, to, to sniff either out. I think, you know, I think that, I, I, mean, I kept saying to Johnny, I think he just goes home, he, he gets through half a bottle of bourbon, he rings a whore, you know, he finishes the bourbon, he does whatever he wants to do, and he goes to work at nine o'clock, you know, and you wouldn't know that he actually did that, you know, quite perverse, so we, we were going for something there, but we weren't trying to put, like, bring our character to it, we're just trying to do every scene as originally as we could possibly yeah, I guess do it, so, that's yeah. what we were kind of persevering with all the time as, as something to, you know, I mean, one of the personal reasons. One of the hard things, you know, for David, and I'm sure you know, we talked about this, is that, you know, De Vere's is an incredibly important character and yet there's not, you know, he's, he's active throughout the, throughout the film, but there's not a lot that in, in the script that kind of um, identifies who he is. Um, and that's, you know, that's the hard thing when you've got a character piece. Um, with so many characters trying to, and it sort of comes back to the question that was over here, was, was you know, being true to all the characters, not yeah. just one. Um, but then you're trying to play the tone of the film too, you exactly. know, you're also yeah. trying to lock in, you're seeing that, you know, Spiteri is that, and such and such is that, and, you know, so, you know, in terms of that, you're just trying to play the tone, as opposed to Bob Hawke, where you go and read everything you can read, watch everything you can watch, you know, listen to everything you can listen to, get as close to that iconic thing that you're after, you know, but the approach is still ultimately the same. You're trying to find the inside first and then hopefully the rest, you know, comes together, I think. Just time for another couple. Has, yep. um, sorry. So, okay, yep. Has Chris written anything else that's been produced? No, this is his first screenplay. He has written two novels. Though. Yeah. Yeah. He, um, and he's working on other things, but yeah, it's his first thing. Some great closing addressing. Sorry? Um, gone and uh, cop this. Very fruity Gold Coast stories. They're very, very, uh, very complex yeah. crime novels. One, Gone in particular, is based on uh, a case called the, about the Beaumont children, the three children who disappeared in, uh, in Adelaide in the 60s, I think. Very, very complicated book. Yeah. Um, were the discussions in the team between the director and the producers to cut the movie even shorter? And if so, which scenes um, did you talk about? Um, what, even shorter than it was now? Um, uh, look, you know, there's always a process of, you know, um, of different people's opinions as to, you know, where things get shortened and, you know, and, and often, it, it, often it, it, it comes down to personal taste as much as anything else. 
Um, and, uh, you know... Were there some scenes you had to fight for? Um, yeah, I mean, for example, um, the, the scene where there was some discussion about the scene where we come back to the Barrington and um, our Crusher playing pool on the new pool table. Um, and he reiterates his, they're talking about the salmon. There was some discussion about losing that, um, which I fought very, and I don't know, Martin did as well. It wasn't from, from sort of producer director thing, but it was discussed, that was discussed as well. Um, but, and, and it actually was a longer scene, and we'd, we'd cut it down. And the, the question was, do we need the scene? And um, I felt very strongly that you did. So that was one. Um, we lost a, a, quite a large scene. Probably the biggest scene we lost was one, a, a chicka scene where he goes to threaten Halliwell, um, the, 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 the accountant, not to talk. Um, and it was probably the one scene that, for one reason or another, didn't quite come off the page onto, onto film as well as, you know, probably. But it will be available on the DVD in the yes, deleted exactly. scenes. <laughs> One last question. All right, well, if awards are um, pressing, so if you want to vote, I think there's some forms around to vote tonight, or you can vote on the web. And I guess, do you want to wrap up, or you want to thank well, I everyone? I just wanted for... to say, look, we've got some great insights into the film and the project. The price. So if we could thank the gentleman on stage. <laughs> I'm not smart enough, and I only went to junior at school. Get in square. Now showing.